But what's the idea of Neocropolis? Neocropolis, the idea is to create some a fraternity, a fraternity of individuals beyond culture, beyond uh, boundaries, beyond race, beyond uh, countries. It's, it's a fraternity based on search for some sort of truth, which binds us beyond all these separations. In order to crea create this kind of fraternity, what we, the, uh, the way to do it is through philosophy, study of comparative uh, religion, arts, science, in order to understand what are the laws of the universe, what are the laws of nature. And since we humans are a part of nature, these laws also govern us. So the whole idea is to bring out the potential within an individual and to see how this individual has a role to play in society and hence to engage with the world, hence to create a better world. Uh, in short, Neotropolis helps an individual to fall in love with wisdom, that is Sophia. And all of us who are here are volunteers and we volunteer to do everything in order to make ourselves better, in order to recognize who we are and contribute to make this world a better place. Um, from a cultural point of view, what we emphasize on is trying to bring back classical values, classical culture, in terms of being timeless, uh, irrespective of whatever uh, period of time. Classical values are those which never get outdated. So hence this attempt, and uh, hence Miti Desai, who is a wonderful special artist, also a philosopher in a way, uh, through her art, is going to speak to us what, what her experience is. Miti is the founder and creative head of Miti Design Lab an interdisciplinary design space. Yes, the word to note here is interdisciplinary, which uh, in a way we can talk about. Communication through the external medium of design led <coughs> Neeti to an internal expression of body design, rediscovering classical Indian dance. For her, there is a very fine line between design and dance. Classical Indian dance for Miti is a multi-dimensional design. Both are forms of expression, she revels in. She finds that classical Indian dance has reintroduced her to traditional design, culture and aesthetics, which are key players in her design practice. Indian design has been the key to her return to her cultural roots, symbols and worldview resulting in an innate understanding of culture and aesthetics and its influence and inspiration in design and in becoming that of a designer. As she said in one of her interviews, within one idiom there are different layers of design that take form to complete the design of classical Indian dance. Classical Indian dance at once engages in philosophy, spirituality and aesthetics. It by itself is devised and designed in a way that it facilitates an inward journey and the practice of it gives immense energy penetrating into the inner life. Basically dance is intrinsic to, it lends itself to a sense of freedom, a sense of engaging or maybe touching upon with what we call spirit, soul, there are many words. But there is something in movement, any kind of mind-body discipline lends itself to that. There is a beautiful quote actually I read this morning and I thought I should read it out. So I'm going to read this quote out. It is by a French poet, philosopher, author. It says that the dance can reveal everything mysterious that is, that, that is hidden in music. It has the additional merit of being human and palpable. Dancing is poetry with arms and legs. I thought it was very, very beautifully put in as I was planning and planning the talk for this evening. I thought that this is something that I should read. That dance is intrinsic to something that lends itself to just a high. So what is it about movement? What is it about the mind-body discipline? that makes one experience that is also something that we are going to flow through. But what we are principally going to talk about is the classical Indian dance. When I say Indian dance, what comes to our minds? When I say Indian dance, it's a very broad word. I'm sorry? 
Beauty. What forms of Indian dance do we all know? Have we seen? Bharat Natyam. Kuchipudi, Kathakali. No one is going to say Bollywood. So, I'm sorry. Bhangra. So, yeah, I'm happy you said that. So, what is the difference between Bhangra and, say, Bharat Natyam? Much more structure. Much more structure. So, what has been the journey of evolution of movement in society? Basically, when society was still developing, there were tribal dances. What, were, what are tribal dances? Dancing in praise of nature. Very ritualistic. Dancing for the rains to come. Dancing for maybe harvesting. These were tribal dances. But as society developed, there came folk dances. And that Bhangra is a folk dance. Less structure. Folk dances are actually a celebration of people of society, of festivals. When we when do we do folk dances? So one very prominent folk dance is Ras Garba that happened during Navratri. What happens? People come together and dance. It is about celebrating togetherness, humanity. It is about celebrating just the basic principle of unity. And that is why if you see all folk dances are group dances. There aren't any folk dances which are not group dances all over the world. India is very rich in its dance forms. Almost every state has its own folk dance. And there are some states which might have two, three variations of the folk dance. So we have probably more than 25 folk dances and we are the only country which will have so many folk dances. The European culture has fantastic folk dances. So if you kind of study there, you will see the Polish dances, very beautiful, but all done as group dances. Why am I emphasizing on this? You, It will all kind of come together. Folk dances in India are also symbolic. Tribal dances strongly ritualistic. Folk dances symbolic. What is the symbolism? Symbolism in relation to nature, symbolism in relation to community growing. It's about growth. So when you say a Baisakhi is a festival that happens around the 14th of January, it is a harvest festival. So in this harvest festival, basically people come together and celebrate but then they dance and then they do the Bhangada at that time. So there is a symbolism that people are coming together to invoke nature. It is about all coming back to nature, fall nature, because we are completely interrelated and interconnected with the environment that we exist in. If you think of the Ras Garba, it is a nine day dance where you dance for the goddess. It is a community event. Women from households come together in a circle. I'm sure all of you all know the form. They come together and dance, but there is a very strong symbolism over here. And what is the symbolism? It is celebrating the highest potent Shakti, the female feminine energy. So there's a beautiful story that you, it was the nine days of Navaratri. It's called nine nights. So why is it nine nights? The mythology says that there was a demon called Mahishasura. This demon was dis completely destroying everything. So the gods thought that he needs to be destroyed, that we need to end this. Each and every god fought, tried to fight him. But he was so swift, he was so strong, he was so clever that not one god, by god you mean, see these words don't take things very, like it's very verbal, but by God it is that absolute energy and in, in Indian thought each and every concept or principle <coughs> has been given a form. So it is that principle which is so positive and strong could not fight this. That demon, a demon is also a symbol of something, but it has a form, Mahishasura. So then what did they do? 
they they requested the goddess but a, the virgin goddess of 16 year old what what is virginity over here symbolize potent energy yet potent energy they invited the goddess each and every god gave her their weapon so she was a goddess with all the weapons and then she fought this demon for 9 days and 9 nights and then she destroyed him. what is this demon a symbolism of the demon is the sim is a symbol of the ego it is nothing but the ego and it took the goddess the virgin goddess using all the weapons of all the gods and nine days and nine nights to fight the ego so that kind it's just a symbolism that this is how our ego is completely swift agile you will not know when it emerges when it doesn't emerge it took the goddess so this navaratri is actually nine nights and nine days you dance in awareness to destroy that ego every year so that's the symbolism so all i'm trying to say is so there are stories within stories in at every aspect in the symbolism but folk dances group dances highly symbolic and then as society evolved as the mind intellectually evolved emerged and developed was classicism so what is classical when we say classical what does classical really mean what does classical mean what something that has stood which is uh, which is uh, old enough and stood the test of time to something that is old enough and so that it could become class anything else something like that i'm sorry without distortion or without distortion the way something that doesn't change meaning over time something that is timeless yeah. but what makes it timeless is what we are trying to understand here the inherent purity why is it pure because because, because you go the down to the level the lowest level of of that uh, form and then you go up so you actually need deconstruct and reconstruct okay classical is that which has a value classical is that which has a vision a vision which is timeless it's not a small vision it is a vision that encompasses the five elements that encompasses encompasses nature and much beyond classicism is an approach so as the mind developed as society developed it became more subtle concerns became that which is subtle and that which is subtle requires requires the highest awareness and very intense discipline that is classical so in this language and in the progression of dance and movement that's how the classical indian forms emerged that now first there were tribal dances society was simple all they wanted to is let the rains come let us have our harvest let us live as a community so they were all ritualistic dances and then they came there are folk dances and the folk dances also said are symbolic in relation to the gods and goddesses which are a layer of actually principles but they are also very much related to nature reaping dances and harvesting dances and dances for you know even rains there are certain communities which have folk dances also like that but all group dances that we all together let's all together celebrate let's all come together as a society yes that's one level of development but then comes the individual development and that's subtle and that is classical if you see the classical indian dances they are all designed as solo forms it's the individual journey so one of you just said that you know bharatnatyam is more structured yes very much so why is it structured why is it so difficult because it requires heightened awareness 
the inner journey is that which requires that. So how did these forms emerge also is that India, I don't even know if I can use the word India, but maybe the Vedic thought, because India is much more than Vedic thought, intuited that the purpose of life is nothing but to evolve. And that was a revelation, complete truth, that this human form that we come on, come on earth, the goal is so that you evolve. The goal is so that you transcend. The goal is so that you can reach the highest potential that you are capable of. It is a, it is a very difficult goal actually. An individual personal journey where the goal is for me to grow. If I have to grow and it is about liberation in the end. So they, the sages or the masters or the guides, It was just a revelation that the purpose of life is to get moksha, is to get liberation, is to reach that absolute. And then they said, <coughs> now let people engage in this world, but that is the sole purpose. And this is something that is very potent in Indian thought. If you see actually any of the, all religions all throughout the world, but in India it is very strong, like even at as my teacher says it, that even at the very local level, like if you will sit in a rickshaw and if you are going from one spot to the other or a taxi, that person in the front seat will give you philosophy. Or even the vegetable seller, at some point he will give you some philosophy. Why? Because we have heard this since we are little. We might not be practicing it, maybe that is irrelevant, but it is there ingrained in the environment. That the purpose is this. Now this mammoth vision that in each of us, in just this individual soul now, if we have to transcend and reach the absolute, how do we do it? So then at that point, they visualized that there has there have to be many ladders, they maybe need ladders, the human form needs ladders to reach that. And that's how the classical Indian arts were created. They are ladders which can lend themselves to transcendence. Who doesn't want to grow? Is there anyone over here who doesn't want to grow? It's a very simple thing. It's not about religion. It is not about... It's just simple. Who does... Is there anyone who doesn't want to grow? Even the plant grows. Even the child grows. Whether you are conscious or whether you are unconscious. Nature lends itself to growth but as we become more mature then we are kind of closing our doors of growth we all want to grow it is just human nature that we want to grow and so this value got many forms and they designed these very intelligently like softwares that if you want here are these many forms <coughs> and the classical indian arts whether you take classical indian music whether you take classical Indian dance, whether you take even classical sculpture or painting or even classical architecture, they have this quality ingrained in the form. And that is how classical Indian dance emerged. Classical Indian dance is multi-layered first in the form. I'll explain to you. The physical structure of the form, multiple layers. There is the design of music layered with design of poetry and then there is a design of movement. So that is why it's very difficult to kind of process classical Indian dance because at once you are engaging with music, you are once engaging with the poetry that the music is kind of representing and then you are engaging with the movement and you are getting a multi-dimensional expression but that is not it, that is the design of form and then there is a design of content strong philosophical content which is through themes, through mythology, through symbols all taking you to actually a principle and then finally there is a design of an experience that it lends itself to. 
experience for the practitioner experience for the viewer it is an intellectual experience it's a physical experience or it could be a transcendental experience so the shastras very beautifully say it that from the formless comes the form and the form takes you back to the formless to me this particular line is a sum total of what classical indian dance stands for there is a form extremely structured extremely intense difficult to comprehend to understand to experience and even to practice and then but the purpose of that form is to take you back to that form if that sometimes in the in the journey the form is so strong that you forget or the formless in the end kind of drops so that is an individual practitioner's challenge through their practice of the discipline <coughs> but from the formless comes the form and the form takes you back to the formless traveling through mythology through symbols the dance pierces into stories into principles into faith into devotion and thus transcendence this is actually the sum total of what classicism stands for singing and dancing in praise is praise of gods and goddesses has been a part of our culture why because actually the gods and goddesses are nothing but symbols which are actually pointing to principles and those principles are supposed to enter our lives and they say and they felt that if you sing and dance in praise of that somewhere that principle you understand and it will enter your life and that was the sole purpose that is the sole purpose of all the temples that we have all the mantras that we have all the mantras the rituals or whatever it is not about merely worshiping a ganapati you need to understand what the ganapati stands for and some of that principle <coughs> needs to penetrate within if it doesn't there is no need to go to temples so there's one dance that i will now show you which very beautifully kind of gathers this symbolism and aesthetic of the dance it is in praise of shiva shiva is a god from the indian pantheon i'm sure everyone is acquainted with shiva but what does shiva stand for one is that i don't understand what shiva stands for i have learned this discipline which lends itself at the aesthetic level to a certain level of integration for me and i have basic devotion and i dance shiva yes i can do that for the rest of my life but the form the classical form has it has something more that it can reveal to understand what shiva stands for this dance piece beautifully says that shiva is the one who is swayambho swayambho is the one who is self born in indian philosophy there are stories for everything because they felt that you need forms without all in, in all intellectual understanding it is not possible and they feel emotions are important love is important beauty is important that's why these forms are beautiful and they are beautiful to a extent that it is so dangerous that you can just get stuck in the beauty and you never bypass it but the idea is to pierce through that beauty of the form and go to the principle of the formless and so there are stories so now in this dance piece he is swayambho that shiva who is independent of all these bondages just absolute energy and then there is a beautiful story over there that he is gangadhara shankara he is the one who, so if you see the form of shiva you will see the ganga flowing like in any of the paintings or anything you will see ganga flowing so there is a story over here so the dance will flow through principles 
symbols, stories, and there are multiple layers of layers. It says Ganga Dhara Shankar. So there is a story, and the story is that Ganga, the river, pure, beautiful, young, very proud. The gods asked her to flow on earth. She said that if I flow on earth, because of my force, the whole earth is going to get destroyed. But the gods said, no, but you must flow on earth. She is obedient. She says that if you all are instructing, then be it. But she is proud. She knows that the moment she is going to flow, she is going to destroy the earth. But well, they are telling me, so I am going to do it. And thus she flows on earth in joy, in beauty and in pride. Shiva, the form, but actually the principle, watches her. He watches her flow and one by one he opens his matted locks. Shiva, if you have seen, has matted locks. So the jata, he opens. He opens and he receives Ganga in it. She gets entangled. His hair she gets, she gets entangled, she tries to find a way, but cannot find any way. She feels, where am I stuck? And that's how he binds her pride. And then he releases her, but just one small trickle that flows up. And that is the Tantra. So he is the one who will take away your pride, but then release you. So that is the symbolism of the story. So the dance will show you the Ganga flowing, Shiva opening his matted locks and then she gets entangled and he releases her and thus she resides on his forehead. He is the one with three eyes. He is the one with multiple hands. He is the one with multiple heads. He is the one which has snakes entwined. Why is the form being described? I'm trying to become him. So one very beautiful thing about classical Indian dance or any dance form is that right now when I will dance this piece, I am Shiva. I become Shiva. If a painter paints Shiva, they will say, that is Shiva. Classical Indian dance has this quality. A performing art has that quality. So close, completely one with yourself. Now I will become Shiva. So I will be in front of you and I will be Shiva. It's not that I am Shiva, but it is that I am trying to come as close to the principle of Shiva. And the closer I get to that principle, the closer you will get to that principle. <laughs>
somehow or the other. This is what I feel. It is the intention, the integrity, and the intensity of the practitioner for it to reveal its absolute. I'm traveling and I'm trying. <laughs>